I want to preach to you a little bit from my book, something I've never preached here. And I want to title this message, I Smell Victory. Somebody say, I smell victory. John chapter 12, verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived. Y'all remember Lazarus, right? Now, Lazarus, if you were to look at his story, he didn't smell like victory at, at first. When Jesus came to the tomb, they said his body stinks. Some of us have been through some stinky stuff. Some of us have carried the stink of our old sin and our old shame and regret and, and things that we've done in our life and we're not proud of. But when Jesus got finished with Lazarus, the stench of death was swallowed up with the smell of victory. Somebody say, I smell victory in this house tonight. Come on, you got a smell of victory. Tell that person next to you, say, you, say, you smell like victory. You smell like victory. You smell good. Yeah, just sniff them out for a second. I got two dogs at our house, and they're always sniffing. They're looking for food. They're sniffing around the house. I got five kids that are always sniffing. They walk in the kitchen. They go, I smell bacon. I smell, daddy's, daddy's making pancakes. Daddy's making eggs. Daddy's making bacon. I smell something. Somebody say, I smell something. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus had lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And there was a dinner party being given in Jesus' honor, and Martha was serving. While Lazarus was among the group of people reclining at the table with Jesus, Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet. And she wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance. The house was filled with the fragrance of that perfume. I got a question for you tonight. What, what fragrance fills this house? What fragrance fills your house? glory I think this is a story when I read this I think this is a story where God is telling us there's a fragrance that I want there's a fragrance that God inhabits he inhabits the praises of his people throughout scripture there's 62 different verses that deal with fragrance perfume the scent of God the fragrance of God we always think about all the different you know uh, senses of God right there's eyesight, there's hearing, there's touching, and there's tasty, taste and see that the Lord is good. But we forget about the nose. You know, God has a nose. God has nostrils. We've been made in the image of God. God can smell you. God can smell me. God doesn't smell what we put on the outside. God smells what's going on on the inside. And I came to preach to you tonight a message about the fragrance that God wants to produce in your life. It says that when she worshiped Jesus, the house was filled with the fragrance. Everybody say, filled with the fragrance. But one of the disciples was angry, Judas Iscariot, the one that would later betray him. He objected when he saw the fragrance. He said, what? Why are you wasting money that could be used for the poor to pour out this fragrance this perfume on Jesus this is a waste of a year's wages verse 6 says he did not say this because he cared about the poor isn't it interesting that Jesus can see past what we say on the surface Jesus knew he wasn't talking because he cared about the poor Jesus sees what's going on on the inside Jesus cares more about our inside than our outside Jesus cares more about the perfume on the inside of your heart because you can smell good on the outside, but you can stink on the inside. You could, I mean, the Pharisees, they cleaned the outside of the cup and it looked good, it looked clean, but Jesus said the inside was full of dirt. So Jesus says, check your fragrance, check your fragrance. Judas was angry over this and he said, we could have used this to help the poor. And Jesus 
Jesus could see past his words, he said, um, Judas didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used the money to help himself to what was put into it. Verse 7, he says, leave her alone. Leave her alone. It was intended that she would save this perfume for the day of my burial. Even the death of Christ had a fragrance with it. We just heard a powerful message on glory. And I think about how the glory of God oftentimes comes with a fragrance. It comes with a, a smell, a scent. So Lord, I pray that you would speak to us tonight, God. I pray, Lord, that we would leave changed by the fragrance of your Holy Spirit, God. Move in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. I'll call you back in just a minute. Can we give the worship team a big hand one more time? Come on, so good. So on my way here, my cologne broke on the inside of my suitcase and drenched my clothes in cologne. <laughs> my son, he loves my cologne. How many of y'all got a bottle of cologne that you really like at your house or perfume? Perfume. How many of y'all got a smell that you like? You like this smell. All right, so I have a smell that my wife bought for me because she likes to pick out my cologne. She likes to pick out my fragrance. And my son really likes it. So he'll come in there, and he's 10 years old. I got three boys, two girls. My 10-year-old will come in. He'll take my cologne, and he'll just start spraying. I'm like, stop. You only need one spray. I'm like, you are, you are using up all of my cologne. And he's like, Dad, I just want to smell good for the ladies. I'm like, this kid, I don't know where he gets this from, but... He wanted to smell like his dad. Even kids can detect good smells. The power of smell. There are certain smells that can even take you back to memories. Like when I go over to my grandmother's house, she has a distinct smell of like mothballs and like cigars. And like, there's like a smell of my grand. When I smell certain things, I'm like, oh, that reminds me of my grandmother's house. When I smell someone cooking outside a good steak or a good burger, it brings me back to these childhood memories of cooking outside with my family, grilling out. The fragrance that you carry spreads everywhere you go. I think about the commercials we see on TV, these ridiculous cologne commercials with like Matthew McConaughey, Justin Bieber, whoever it is, Cameron Diaz, Beyonce, Brad Pitt, and, and they, they walk in with this cologne and it's like, it gives them confidence. Like a good smell makes them feel beautiful. A good smell makes them feel handsome. A good smell makes them feel more confident in who they are. But when I look in the scripture, the fragrance that God was interested in was a fragrance that was different than what you smell on the outside. In Genesis chapter 8, when the ark landed after the flood, one of the first things that happens is Noah builds an altar, a sacrifice to God. Genesis 8 verse 20. And when he builds this sacrifice to God, this, this altar to the Lord for saving his family, this burnt sacrifice goes up in the air, and the Bible says God smelled the aroma. Tell that person next to you, say, God smells you. God smelled the aroma of the, the, the burnt offering, and afterwards he was pleased with it, and he put a rainbow in the sky. God responds to our fragrance. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Thanks be to God who leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place we go. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ. So what does the fragrance of Christ smell like? It, it, I'll tell you one thing. It doesn't smell like pride. It doesn't smell. There was a group of people that Jesus wanted to reach. It was his hometown, Mark chapter 6. He shows up to his hometown to preach and minister. And the Bible says that they, they all of a sudden they started questioning him. They were like, we know this kid. You know? We know this kid. We watched him grow up in diapers. We know his dad. We know his mom. And their familiarity killed their fragrance. Their familiarity was a fragrance. 
their familiarity actually robbed them. Jesus was re repulsed by their pride and their familiarity and their sense of there's nothing new you could teach me. Jesus could smell the fragrance in his hometown. He said, a prophet is not without honor except for in his hometown. In Luke chapter 4, same thing. A crowd is listening to him preach, and they start questioning him. They start challenging everything he said. This is what the serpent did in Genesis 3. Did God really say? See, when I put off a fragrance of questioning God, challenging God, refusing to be teachable by God, refusing to have an expectant faith, that fragrance, my fragrance either compels Christ into my life or repels Christ out of my life. Are you compelling the presence of God into your life with a fragrance of hunger? See, I, you know what I love about this church? Y'all are hungry. Y'all are hungry. Any hungry people? Anybody come to eat tonight? Come on, you came to eat. You came to get everything God has for you. You know, God responds to hunger. God's like, mm, that smells good. I smell some hungry Christians. When God started speaking to John on the island of Patmos about the churches, one of the biggest things he said is he says, you've, you've lost your first love. You've lost your ability to hunger. And because you've lost your hunger, you've lost your fragrance. So he says, you're doing good things for people. And you're helping people, but you've, you've forsaken your first love. There's something about a, a hunger and a love and a passion for God that God says, that smells good. That's what, like, when I think about the fragrance of Christ, I think about a fragrance of humility. A fragrance of teachability. A fragrance of hunger for God. I wonder if some of us have lost our wonder and our faith and our expectations for God to move. We have a school back home connected to our church. By the way, your pastor preached on the rooftop of our church. He got, we were on a scissor lift and we were about to go up into the air. And I think he was thankful because the scissor lift broke in the middle of it. And we instead climbed on top of a 30 foot roof and he preached from the, and he preached a powerful message. Come on, he always brings the fire. It was great. But our church has a school. And um, I was walking through the school with my kids. I was taking, I have a fifth grader, a third grader, a second grader, a kindergarten. I got too many kids. So I'm taking all my kids, <laughs> I'm taking my kids to school. And all of a sudden I smell something. I'm like, what is that? And everybody's like, ah, ah this is terrible. They're like, Pastor, do something about this. I'm like, what do you mean do something? I don't have any, I don't have any, I don't have any good smelling spray. And I was like, what happened? And they said, some kid let off a stink bomb. Y'all know what a stink bomb is? And it stinks up the whole hallway. It's like he was doing a prank. But when that stink bomb went off, everybody exited the building. Everybody exited the school. Because bad smells drive people away. Bad fragrances drive people away from the church. And it wasn't until we could get some good fragrance in the hallways that people finally felt like they could come back into the room. And they were like, okay, the stink bomb is gone. I wonder if God's trying to remove some stink bombs from some of our lives. Where he's saying, I wanna dwell, I wanna move, I want to pour out my spirit. I want to do something fresh in you. But there's some stuff. When I was in college, a group of guys, we were, we were part of a floor where we would have like wars with other guys on other floors that lived in the dorms. And so one of the wars we did was we would hide. This is really bad, but we found a dead squirrel outside. And we would find like dead roadkill, like squirrels or whatever was killed on the road. And we would put it inside a bag. We'd put gloves on. We'd put it inside a bag. And then we would stuff it in their ceiling so they couldn't find it. And so we did this to a group of guys. And, and their whole hallway was stinking for the next, like, month. They could not find the stink. And it started stinking up the whole dorm. I mean, we're talking, like, multiple floors, Bradley. 
By the way, isn't Bradley amazing? I love Bradley. I love his family. I was telling him his mom inspires me. I, I, like, I just, I want to be more like her. I love the courage of his family. But the whole dorm was stinking because they couldn't find the dead squirrel. And finally, we were like, this is so sad. We got to go help them. So we went and showed them. We said, hey, there's, a, there's something dead in your hallway. I wonder if the Holy Spirit is saying this to you. There's something dead in your house. There's something dead in your life. When I was younger, my mom bought me a hamster for my birthday. I really wanted a pet, so she bought me a hamster. Well, my dog came in, and um, <laughs> he knocked over the hamster's cage, and when the hamster tried to get out, the dog was so scary, went, Rah! the hamster froze and had a seizure and died. The hamster was like, <laughs> and just, I mean, my ha I watched it happen. I was like, how do I get that out of my mind? That was the worst thing that happened. And the hamster had a seizure and died. And, um, and I felt really bad for it. And I had seen, like, different guys I know who had, like, you know, um, they had, like, deer antlers on the wall. And they had, like, you know, animals that they would. That they, so I, I put my hamster up on my wall, my actual dead hamster. I, I, like, put him on a plaque, and I put him on my wall. And my mom was like, what are you doing? I said, this, this was once my hamster. Now that he's dead, I just want to remember him. She said, Paul, that's a carcass. That's a dead animal. I said, Mom, there's other people that hang their animals up. In the she was like, no, Paul, this is gross. This is disgusting. We need to get this thing. We need to bury this thing. We need to have a funeral for this thing. We don't need to keep carrying something that's dead in our house. And I think about how some of us are carrying some stuff that's still dead. And God says, you need to bury that. You need to have a funeral for that because it's stinking up your house. <laughs> Who or what has been stinking your fragrance up? Is it sin? Is it critical thinking towards people? Is it being negative about yourself all the time, just putting yourself down? I walked into one of my kids' rooms the other night, and he was like, Daddy, I'm not as handsome as the other brothers. And I said, who said that? He was like, I don't know, I just, I think I'm not as handsome. He's like, you know, I just don't look like they are, and I don't play sports like they play sports. And he was putting himself down. And I said, I want you to say this over yourself. I am, and he was like, I am. I said, a mighty man of God. He was like, a mighty man of God. I said, I am. He was like, I am. A handsome man of God. And he was like, Daddy, I don't feel like I'm handsome. <laughs> And I was trying to train his mind because his words were putting a fragrance off. As his dad, I was saying, no, 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 no. Son, you are a mighty man of God. You're made in the image of God, and God doesn't make mistakes. You're called by God. You don't have to be like your brothers to be special. You're special just the way you are. Some of us are stinking up our own fragrance by our words, by our thoughts, by our comparison with others. In John chapter 3, there was a moment of comparison between the disciples. I want to go to verse 22. It says, Jesus and his disciples, they went out to the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and he was baptizing them. And John was also baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John went to prison. And there was an argument that started developing between the disciples. And they came to John and they said, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he's baptizing and everyone is leaving our church and they're going to his church. They're all going to see him now. And to this, John replied, look at the fragrance of John's heart. This is a great picture of a fragrance of humility. He says, a person can receive only what is given to them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and he listens for him and he's full of joy. Can't you see the Christ-like fragrance inside of John? He's not threatened. 
He's not jealous. He's not depressed. He's not suicidal. He's not throwing in the towel. He's not giving up on ministry. He's joyful. He's excited. He's celebrating other people. He's, he's, he's just happy that he's alive. He's got a fragrance of, he's got an attractive spirituality. He's got a fragrance that people want to be around. Is your fragrance a, a fragrance that people want to be around? One time I, I went to the store and I bought this $5 um, fragrance called Axe and I sprayed it all over myself because I was, I was in a hurry and I was going on a date night with Ashley and I wanted to smell good and I got in the car and she goes, what are you wearing? I said, I'm wearing Axe and she goes, oh, Paul. She was like, I have better, per, better cologne for you to wear. Why are you wearing the cheap stuff? I said, well, I was in a hurry and I just had to get something quick. She said, you have something better to wear. Why aren't you wearing it? I said, I just forgot and I was in a hurry. And she was like, Paul, we're going to have to change this shirt because this smell is too much for me to smell right now. <laughs> so we went and we changed because the smell was so pungent. It was so noticeable. It was so recognizable. I wonder sometimes if God is... He's watching us while we worship out here, and he says, before you keep singing, I need you to come down to the altar and forgive somebody that you've been bitter towards. How can I accept your offering of worship when you have unforgiveness in your heart towards someone that I love? See, Jesus was always challenging the internal fragrance of his followers. So John the Baptist, he says this, he says, my joy is complete. Verse 30, he must increase, I must decrease. He must become greater, I must become less. Did anyone see the movie Toy Story? Toy Story? There was a character named Buzz Lightyear. Y'all remember Buzz Lightyear? Okay, so um, when I was younger, I, I loved the movie Toy Story. And I always kind of felt like Woody. Woody is this character that was like, he's just a good old cowboy. He's, you know, people like him, and he's, he's one of the leaders of all the toys. But then Buzz Lightyear shows up, and Buzz Lightyear starts getting all the attention and all the attraction, and people start talking to Buzz Lightyear. And now, you know, Woody's looking at him, and he's like, that's not flying. That's falling with style. He's getting jealous of, of Buzz Lightyear's, you know, attention and Buzz Lightyear's skills. Well, when I read this story, I think about this. I think about how John the Baptist has a chance to either get jealous of Jesus or a chance to recognize he's also just as special, but his goal is not to become the greatest. His goal is actually to decrease. That you and I, we have an option. And so I, ha I had my own test in this. Um, five, five or six years ago, our church was the largest church in our city. And uh, there was a lot of young people coming to our church. And then all of a sudden, people started going, hey, have you heard about this guy named Mike Todd? And they were like, we all need to go to Mike Todd's church. And I was like, wait, what about Paul Doherty? What about, we're in the same city. And I knew Mike. Me and Mike are friends. Mike actually recorded my first album when I was in a band and I was making music. Me and Mike made music together when we were kids. And so now we were pastoring churches in the same city. And I remember in 2018, me and him, we were both on the same, like, I had like, I don't know, 5,000 followers on Instagram, so did he, and, 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 and all of a sudden, I wake up one day, and he's got like 100,000 followers on Instagram, and now people are leaving our church and going to his church, and then on YouTube, his sermons are having millions of views, and I see Mike later that week, because his kids come to school at our church, they go to Victory Christian School, so I see him, and he's like, Paul, he's like, have you seen what the Lord has done in my church? And I was like, yeah, very cool, very cool, Mike. I was like, I'll see you later, man. I'm in a hurry right now. And he was like, hey, guess what, Paul? He's like, Stephen Furtick invited me to come preach for him at Elevation Church. I was like, cool, man, very cool, very cool, nice. And I was jealous. I, I wouldn't call it jealousy in that moment, but looking back on it, it was, it was a fragrance of envy and jealousy, and Mike Todd was like my Buzz Lightyear. I was like, he's, he's not really 
that awesome? I'm more cooler than him. You know, I'm like trying to tell the other toys. I'm like, he's not flying. That's falling with style. And uh, Mike and I, we would run into each other. We would go to breakfast like every couple months. And so he had been asking me to go to breakfast with him. I was like, Mike, I'm busy right now. And, and secretly, I didn't want to meet with him because I was sad that I was losing people from the church that I pastored that were now going to his church. And I called my mentor, I called my pastor, Larry Stockstill. And I said, Pastor Larry, I said, I need to confess something to you. And he's the one that I call and confess all my sins to. So I call him, I just said, I need to confess a sin to you. And he was like, okay. Um, he said, what is it, Paul? I said, uh, I've been struggling with comparison. I've been dealing with jealousy and envy. And he said, Paul, you're, you're doing great. You're doing awesome. Who would you be jealous of? God's blessed you. He's blessed your family and your church. Paul, you guys are, are, you guys are doing great. Why are you jealous and who are you jealous of? I said, well, I said, there's this church that's really getting big in our city, in Tulsa. And, and he's just gone viral on YouTube. And he goes, Paul, are you talking about Mike Todd? And I was like, yeah. He goes, oh, he's incredible, Paul. I'm like, stop it, shut up, you know, I'm so mad. I just felt like he was stabbing me. I'm like, I'm already wounded right now. You're just killing me. And um, he goes, he's incredible, Paul. He's like the best preacher I've ever heard. And uh, <laughs> I'm like, you're not helping me right now, Pastor Larry. And he starts laughing. And he goes, Paul, there's room in the kingdom for everyone to succeed. And he said, Paul, Mike needs a friend right now because most of the people that are flocking to him are fans. What he really needs is a close friend, someone that knew him before he was famous. And he said, you haven't been able to be his friend because you've been putting off jealousy vibes and this fragrance of comparison and you've made it all about you instead of being there for him. And he said, have you thought about how much the success has impacted his kids and his wife and his family in possibly even negative ways? I said, no, because fame and success, it's all good. He goes, no, it's not. It's trauma for people. Someone who wasn't known in one night and then they're known around the world the next night and they can't go out to eat with their family. They can't even go to the gas station without getting stopped by 100 people. And he said, Paul, my encouragement to you is to first go to God and repent. And then he said, secondly, I think you need to go to Mike Todd and repent. Now, at this time, our church was still doing good. And I was like, God, do I, I so I, I first repented to God. I was like, God, I'm sorry. And I felt the Lord was like, you need to go to Mike. And I was like, God, I went to you. And I felt the Lord saying, you need to go to Mike. And so I called Mike up, and we both just dropped our kids off at school. And he said, um, what's up, Paul? I said, hey, can we meet for breakfast at this diner in town, this breakfast diner restaurant? He said, yeah, yeah, let's go get some chicken and waffles. So we're going there to get chicken and waffles. And, um, and I, it had been a year that I'd been struggling with this, all through the year 2018, 2019. And it was like halfway through 2018 into halfway through 2019. And so I'm sitting down for breakfast, and I walk into the restaurant. As soon as I walk in, he walks in behind me, and the whole restaurant is like, oh, it's Pastor Mike Todd! Transformation Nation! And I was just like, people came up to me. They're like, hey, I don't know who you are, but will you take my picture with me and Mike? I literally was his camera guy for the next 20 minutes just taking pictures of him and all the people inside the Metro Diner restaurant. So then we sit down, and the people there, they recognize us, and they're coming over, and they're talking to Pastor Mike. And, and Mike's like, Paul, we've been meaning to have breakfast for a year, and you keep blowing me off. He's like, what's on your mind? And I was like, Mike, I did not want to say it, but I was like, Mike, I need to say something. And he was like, what is it? And I said, look, God has really blessed you. And he was like, isn't it great? I was like, yeah. <laughs> and I said, you know what, it is. And I said, I've, I've been hating on you, and I haven't been a good friend. And a tear starts 
welling up in his eye, and he was like, I know. He's like, I could tell. I was like, you could tell? He was like, yeah, man. He was like, you were putting off this vibe of jealousy. And he's like, man, this has been hard. He's like, as much as I'm grateful for the increase that God has brought, he said, it, it has been so difficult to just spend time with my kids. It's so difficult to tell who's really my friend and who's just a fan. And he's like, I've been looking for you to be my friend. <laughs> Ask that person next to you, what's your fragrance? What's your fragrance? And so I start crying. And I said, Mike, I love you, man. Like, you're my brother. You're my friend. And I said, I want to be there for you. I want to celebrate with you. I want your church to succeed. I want your worship team to succeed. I want you to succeed. I want your books to succeed. And I want to stop being jealous and threatened and in a comparison trap because God wants all of us to do well in our lives. God doesn't just want some people to. And I start, and he's like, bro, you're preaching right now. I was like, well, this is the sermon that I've been living for the last year. Sometimes you got to live a sermon before you can preach a sermon. And so I was sitting there and... And I want, I want the band to come up. I want to worship here in just a minute. But I was sitting there, and, and the restaurant employees, they come up to us, and they were like, we don't mean to be nosy, but we were listening to you guys. <laughs> and uh, they said, what we just saw transpire just now, what we just saw was the greatest message that either of you could preach. And you weren't on a stage, and you didn't have a microphone because you were two brothers, white man and a black man, coming together in the city of Tulsa where there's been so much racism, so much prejudice, so much pride, so much jealousy, so much war, and you came together in front of all of us. And so the whole restaurant actually got around our table. They said, we wanna get a picture with both of you because you're both uniquely qualified to pastor in this city. <laughs> Joseph, when I tell you, man, like what God did in that moment, God was breaking something in me. You think about when Mary broke her perfume. What was she doing? She was getting vulnerable in front of Jesus. When's the last time you got vulnerable in front of somebody else? Me in front of Mike was actually me in front of Jesus because Jesus lives in Mike and Jesus was waiting for me to get vulnerable in front of a brother and say, brother, I've been dealing with jealousy envy, comparison. I've been preaching on a stage, but secretly harboring things that aren't from God, and I need to repent, and I'm sorry, and I need your forgiveness. And when he forgave me, it felt like Jesus was forgiving me. I had already received the forgiveness of God, but I was receiving the forgiveness of God through a human right next to me. See, some of us, we just want to keep it between us and God, and God says, it can't stop here. It's got to go to the person you had the offense with. Now, for some of you in the room, that, that offense might be impossible to talk to because they're either in jail or they're dead. And in that case, you have to just go straight to God. But in other cases, there are people in the room, people that are in your life, people that you've blocked on Instagram, you've muted them, <laughs> you still follow them in a fake way. What fragrance are you putting out there? And I didn't realize that when I did that, something was gonna break in our church. When I tell you that it felt like the Holy Spirit just showed up in a fresh way in our church, I mean the services are, like the presence of God has gotten so thick in our church in the last few years. Ever since that moment, it's like our worship has gone to another level. My sermons have, have connected with people on another level. Our altar calls have been filled with people. And Mike and I now, when we see each other dropping our kids off at school, we're brothers. We get to laugh together, talk to each other. In fact, he helped me write my book. He literally helped me write mind games. And here's what I know. Here's what I know. That all of us in this room, we have different things that we, we, we battle with. And I don't know what it is that's been messing with your fragrance. But I believe tonight God wants to, to, to do something fresh in you. He wants to renew your fragrance. Acts chapter 2 says, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. When the Holy Spirit comes in the room, the fragrance changes. 
when that woman broke the, the alabaster jar, the room shifted. The atmosphere shifted because fragrance can shift a room. I remember on the day of my wedding when my wife came walking down that aisle in her, in her beautiful white dress, my bride. She wore my favorite fragrance. It was a fragrance I had bought for her while we were dating. And I mean, she covered herself in that fragrance. She wanted the whole room to, to smell the fragrance of the bride. And I think there's a groom in heaven that's waiting for his bride to cover ourselves in a fragrance that he wants, to cover ourselves in a fragrance that he picked out. Did he pick out your fragrance or did you pick it out? Because when he picks it out, he gets excited to smell it. He goes, that's what I've been waiting for, church, a fragrance of compassion, a fragrance of humility, a fragrance of teachability, a fragrance of grace, a fragrance of truth, a fragrance of unity a fragrance of hope, a fragrance of peace, a fragrance of forgiveness. And Ben, can we come up? I want to just worship. I just feel like the Holy Spirit wants to fill this room tonight with a fragrance. And he wants to cover you with the fragrance tonight. Yeah, let's just stand to our feet all over this place. In Leviticus 1 verse 9, it says that the priest would burn the sacrifice at the altar as a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, and a sweet aroma would go up to the Lord. People could smell the fragrance of the sacrifice in the temple. In Exodus 20, verse 23, God instructed the priests to take for themselves quality spices to make a holy anointing, an ointment compounded according to the art of the perfumer. One theologian, A.W. Tozer, put it like this. The fragrance of the anointing oil was unique. If someone went near an Old Testament priest, he could say, I smell an anointed man. I smell an anointed man. I smell the anointing of the holy oil. The aroma, the pungency, the fragrance was so noticeable that the anointing could not be kept as a secret. There's a fragrance in God's word that cannot be hidden. There's a fragrance that's so strong it can't be kept as a secret. It's a fragrance that draws people in. It's a fragrance that pulls people towards Christ. It's a fragrance that brings life in the, in the place of death. It's the fragrance that shows up at the tomb of Lazarus and says there is still resurrection power in our God. It's a fragrance that says even after your worst mistake, Mary, God still has a plan for you. Peter, even after you've denied me three times, there is still a Pentecost waiting for you. It's a fragrance of second chances and third chances because His mercies are new every single morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Some of us have been holding on to a fragrance of shame and resentment, either towards ourselves or towards other people that have let us down or hurt us. I just hear the Lord saying, I want to cover you in a new fragrance tonight. I want to cover you in a new fragrance tonight. I want to help you get over some things that have happened to you. I want to help you forgive some people that have hurt you. I want to help you stop comparing yourself to the people that are, that, are, that are maybe doing something that you want to be doing. And God says, let it go. Let it go. I have success for you too. I have great things for you too. I have, I have a great destiny for you too. Don't get stuck in the comparison trap. God says, let, 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 let your heart be like John the Baptist. I must decrease. He must increase. It's in that humility. God says, I, I humble those who exalt themselves, but I exalt those who humble themselves. Pride leads to a fall, but humility leads to honor. God says, if you'll humble yourself, I promise you, there's promotion coming. There's honor coming. There's glory coming. There's a new fragrance that's coming on you. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here tonight, you just say, man, I just want the fragrance of God's love, His mercy, His truth, His kindness, His compassion. I want that fragrance you've been preaching about to cover me. I want that glory that Pastor Gideon was talking about to cover me, to cover my life. If that's you, just raise your hand all over this place tonight. I want to pray for you. I know Prophet Gideon does too. If you would, just leave your seat. If you raised your hand or you wanted to, just leave your seat. Let's fill this altar tonight. Let's fill this room like Mary with that expensive perfume. Let's pour it out on the feet of Jesus. Let's just begin to worship. Band, do you guys got a song, a worship song we can just go into? Let's just fix our, our eyes and our hearts on him. 
And as we worship, I believe the Holy Spirit is going to pour out an anointing in this place.